Hi, I'm Lily. I hope you're well. Today I'm going to go through a little Q&A with some questions that you've sent over. So thank you so much for taking the time to write me some messages and I'm going to go through them, starting with a message from Kinney who is 11 years old. So thank you so much for writing me this and for asking your parents for the permission to write this email. What drives you to create your content? And I think that's a really good question because I try to create the kind of video that I wish I had. That's the main um, idea behind what I'm creating. Because I'm self-taught, so I come up with weird and wonderful ideas and I always have to figure out on my own how to do that. So I thought if I share all the kind of techniques and processes that I've used to create my project, I can help other people get their own project done quicker, easier, get solution, and yes, basically come up with the thing that I wish I've seen a, a while back. When I got interested into stop motion animation three years ago, I went through every video I can find on YouTube and quite often I've seen that you have some very basic video about starting in stop motion, your first animation, how you make your first puppets, or sometimes you can find some behind the scenes for the very professional uh, videos such as Leica Studio, when you have the most beautiful professional environment and I realized the majority of people will never have access to those kind of resources, a budget for their own animation. So there is a gap and there's something in between missing. And I wanted to show that it's feasible to create some wonderful and beautiful animation at home with some basic installation and basic supply. And I wanted to show that it's feasible step by step and showing in detail, not just a very quick video showing some uh, snap of behind the scenes, but to actually show how to do it step by step. Another question was, what inspired you to become a stop motion animator? Well, I never planned to become a stop motion animator. It kind of happened. I always loved to build stuff, sculpt things with my hand in 3D. And once you get your creation done, if you want to share with people, unless you have someone in person, you're going to share through maybe images. So you share only one side or another side of it. And I thought it's a bit limiting. I want to share more of that. And I realized by making a film out of it, I can turn my creation, whatever it's a building, into something so much more interesting because you're going to be able to shoot it from all different angles and show details of it. Because of all the work that I've put into creating those things, I can actually enjoy and other people hopefully can enjoy it too because they can see so much more of it. And the same goes with making little puppets. You create your little character and your little face, but through the magical process of stop motion animation, you're giving light, you're giving movement, emotion. And that is something very, very special. It's probably the oldest fantasy of all Frankenstein to give life to inanimate objects. But I think it's such an incredible and magical process that once you get into it and you press play and you see the whole sequence play out and your inanimated object come to life, this is something which is extremely exciting and magical. And once you get through that, I understand that it's addictive. I've got another question from Kenneth in Canada who asked about his future short film about a penguin who get lost at sea, which sounds so cute. What should I be paying attention to the most to ensure that the use of more than one scale doesn't throw anything visual off? So he was talking about working on a certain scale, let's say 110 for interior set. And then when you build an exterior set, and that's uh, something that I've tackled in my last video about sense of scale, you can work on different scale. We need to make sure they match visually so it doesn't feel odd. So if I was creating a set that is one tenth, this Gothic uh, church, for example, is one tenth. And let's say you can see through the window and then you create a different set on a different scale because you want to make it feel enormous. I will make sure that the camera that I'm using to shoot the scene, let's say I'm shooting that scene here, I'm going to position the camera with the reference point. So for example, the head of the puppets, and I'm going to put the camera at a certain height with the head of the puppet, which means once I shot the outside scenery, I'm going to position the camera on the same reference point, because if the character on the small scale becomes smaller, the camera needs to be lower to the ground. So for me, it's more about making visual sense of having the same kind of height and position of the camera from what I'm shooting inside to what I'm shooting outside. 
I've not done it personally, but that will be how I tackle this kind of challenge. And instead of just starting and shooting my whole scene thinking, yeah, yeah, that will make sense. I will do some test shots of the outside scenery and the indoor scenery and make sure as a mock-up on the computer with whatever software you're using, make sure it makes visual sense first before starting to shoot the whole scene. And once you're happy with how everything is assembled and all the components on the different masks and layers, then I will shoot the scene. I've got a message from Tima Curry. Hey Lily, how do I promote my work as a stop motion artist in Africa, Kenya? I think wherever the country you are based in, building your social media is probably the most crucial element. It's your business card, basically. I'm been working on my youtube channel for i think it was seven years so it took some time to get there and it's all about consistency and quality so upload some quality content regularly to build up an audience one post at a time one subscriber at a time i use youtube as my main base and i use facebook to promote let's say i've got a new project i've got a new set i've shot an interesting scene i'm going to use this and link it to my youtube channel and there's many other platforms. I'm not on TikTok or Instagram, so I cannot talk about them, but find whatever platform is right for you and upload regularly some quality content. And don't lose hope if at first you don't have lots of reply and lots of messages, you need to build up slowly but surely. I remember reading somewhere that every overnight success is 10 years in the making. And I do believe that because when I look at artists that I'm really inspired by, who have mind-blowing work. Usually they've been at it for 10 years or at least many, many years. And if you look at YouTube channel of people that you really inspire by, looking for how many years they've been doing it. So I think it's really about building up your social media and your profile, one post at a time, one subscriber at a time. It's about patience and you will get there. So slowly build up one day at a time. I've got a question from Bobby regarding which camera I use or I will suggest. Personally, I use a Canon EOS RP. I've been using it for every animation. I don't think I'm the right person to uh, give technical advice regarding camera because there's so many out there and they're so expensive. But I had lots of people reaching out to me about that specific question. And I will say, don't focus too much on the perfect camera. Use what you have. Use the best camera you have available to start practicing, start to get animation. Because realistically, your first animation is not gonna be a masterpiece. And you're probably not gonna win an Oscar with your second animation either. So I think instead of focusing on just getting the best gear, getting the best camera, do with what you have. Use the best camera you have. If you don't have a proper camera and you have your, your phone, just use that. Make sure you have a stable tripod so the whatever camera you use is not moving and make sure you can take the picture remotely because if you have to press on your camera on your phone every time, you're gonna have a little movement. That's the last thing you want. So use what you have and practice and practice. And in the meantime, you can watch all the video about uh, technical advice on the kind of camera and gears you need. So do that in the background, but focusing just on the practice, focus on the practice first and then invest into quality equipment once you are there and you have more experience. I had a question on Facebook from Matthew regarding my tie down. So technically I drill into all my sets and it sounds quite a bit sad because I spend so much time and effort doing my beautiful set and at the end of it I drill right through. But that's what I use for every single animation because my puppets are only held from underneath. It's extremely rare that I use any rig so I just want to have them tie down and I'm gonna uh, add the link at the bottom of the image right now about which tie down I'm using. I'm based in UK, so obviously that's what I can find here. I hope you can find something similar in your country. A message from Francisco on Facebook as well. What advice can you give for someone who is just starting in this, especially for making such small things? I will say invest into proper lighting equipment above your workbench and I've, bought uh, one of those super strong LED, like a daylight type, uh, for my desk a decade ago. And that was one of the best investment because you need to see properly, especially in details what you're doing. 
More recently, I bought an LED light with a magnifying glass included, and that is brilliant for tiny little things. So once you start working in props or once you sculpt ahead of a puppet, for example, you need to see every single detail, every textures. So having those kind of light with a strong LED and ideally with a magnifying glass that you can move around really help to get better results. A message from Chloe, what are your favorite materials to work with for set making? If I have to simplify the material I use, I will say plywood to build all the base of the structure, baza wood in every kind of thickness I can find because you can build so many different things. It's so soft, it's so easy to work with, so, so baza wood is definitely a key uh, material there. And the last one will be warbler. You've seen my video, you know I use warbler all the time because it's so versatile and you can curve it. So compared to the plywood when you have those walls and those base and the main structure, you can start to get into more organic and curved shape with a warbler. So I will say those three materials are my favorite one. I've got a message from Mike. What is your next project? Well, I've recently been working on a miniature tree house. It's a project that I started almost a year ago and I was halfway through the miniature set when I had a problem with my eyes and for a while I left it on the side like you know I just yeah and it was hard but I get back into it I'm just so glad I did because I was able to create something that brought me lots of joy and helped me through the process of getting back into an activity that I've enjoyed so far and I had to put on hold for a while. So I've got this project coming and I'm really looking forward to share it with you. It's uh, different than a typical tree house. It's much more on the whimsical curved side organic shape. So that will be my next tutorial. So I'm working on the editing at the moment. Hopefully very soon I'm going to be able to share it with you. Until then, I hope you're right. I want to thank everyone for the question I received. I was not able to, to answer through this video through everything, but if you have some other questions, send me an email. I'm more than happy to answer to you and I hope that it helped with your project. At the end of the day, that's what my channel is about, to try to share tips and tricks and hope to help you on your own project and on your own journey. Take care.